Uh, we're into our last Christmas story out of Matthew 1, uh, 18 through 25. I, I'm going to focus on uh, Joseph dealing with a major crisis in his life. <coughs> Most of you are familiar with the Christmas story out of Luke and Matthew. If you're going to read the Christmas story, that's where you read it. <coughs> Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2. Uh, I know our family, when they assemble, they always read Luke 2 for Christmas before we open gifts. We talk about the gift until then we open gifts. We always read uh, Luke 2. Little kids like the story of the shepherds. That's their favorite story. They, they like marrying the manger business, but uh, they, they really like the one on the What is interesting about this story is uh, what happens to many of us during the holidays. Elvis Presley talked about a blue, a blue Christmas. Remember that song? Yep. And, and I'll tell you, for a large majority of people in the world, it's a blue Christmas because of so many different concepts of losses in their life. Uh, it, it can be a ter it can be if you lose a, a well whatever you lose and that first Christmas comes around it's a struggle a lot of suicides a lot of suicides yeah a lot of struggles within the Christian church there's a lot of struggles and and the Christian church has worked really hard to try, try to try to gap that with widows and divorced people and things like that that they know they're going through a tough one uh, they try to be inclusive in their life at their Christmas, invite people. I know my family does. We try to we try to include somebody every Christmas that uh, is in our periphery that has a great loss in their life. Uh, you know, when you're depressed like that, you don't want to put a Christmas tree up. You don't want to decorate, even though you know it's festive. But it's just difficult to do it. It's just difficult to do it. And so sometimes when you can't, we, took, we, we used to send teen teens out to widowed homes to put up their Christmas for them. And sometimes they won't even let them do that. And that's, so sometimes if you take them to your festive time where your people are just full of life and energy and Christmas, it, it kind of sets a new tone for them when they go back. Uh, but anyhow, let's have a word of prayer, and I'll tell you about ma Joseph's major crisis at Christmas and how, how he dealt with it and how you can too. Uh, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It distracts you. It takes you out of walking in the Spirit or the dynamics of the whole indwelling Holy Spirit's ministry in your life. Evidence is personal sin. How do you deal with it? Well, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And what that does, it restores you to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that teaching hour, it's really important. John 14, 26 says, The Holy Spirit will teach and recall, teach and recall the word of God through your soul. So this is very important. So I give you a moment. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess, I, I give you that moment within your silence of your own privacy of your priesthood to do that so that you can get the maximum out of this hour of study. Well, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the birth of your Son and his obedience and faithfulness to take that to the cross. I, I we... We can't even imagine what it means to be a hypostatic person, 100% God and 100% man in one unique human being and him go to the cross and die for the sins of the entire world when he himself has committed none. Never. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so we come to today, Father, to talk about the birth Without the birth, there would be no cross. 
It has to be a miraculous conception conceived of the Holy Spirit. And when you understand that, it, that, that very principle changed the heart of Joseph from divorce to marriage. I pray today, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this to our souls that we might learn how to deal with crises in our life where the sadness of our heart can be turned to joy. For it's in Jesus' name we've prayed this. Amen. <clears throat> Proverbs 15, 13 has a message to us this festive year of, thanks, of, uh, of Christmas. And for especially for those who have sadness of losses in their life. Listen to what Proverbs 15, 13 says. A joyful heart. A joyful heart. Now God gave you the heart and he'll give you the joy, but you've got to be willing to put them together. A joyful heart. I mean, if you, if you, if you, you, you can choose to be sad. You can choose to be miserable. You can choose to be alone. These are choices you can make. All right? Now, you, you know, there's a difference between being alone and lonely. It, alone is state, a state of a fact. But lonely is a state of mind. And so you don't have to be lonely. You may be alone, but you don't have to be lonely. And the truth of the matter is, let, let the people who stretch their hand out to you during the holidays that really have a sense of fulfilling a need in your life, that they feel that they're capable of helping you hold your hand and walk you through that, it's a good time to accept that invitation. There's no need to be alone when people stretch out their hand, invite you in and be a part of a festive time of their life. A joyful heart makes a cheerful face. Ain't that the truth? I mean, you can see it when you meet people you smile and say, have a great day or Merry Christmas. And they, they growl. <laughs> because that was a state of mind. They met you when, when, when you met them. But you know what? I guarantee the next person they met, they had a different attitude than the, the one they met with you. They come, they, they're disgusted, they're sad, they're crying. And you say, Merry Christmas. And you smile and you give them, it's a joy to be alive, business, that look. Makes a difference the next person they address. It does make a difference. The other day I was behind a person and we're walking into a, 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 a business place. And I saw a lady coming, she had some packages and a kid, you know. And so I didn't know if the man in front of me would open the door or not. So when she got close to the door, he didn't seem to be moving that direction. I, you know, I pulled out and passed him. <laughs> and uh, we both reached for the door at the same time. So I, I went, well, good. And, uh, and, the, and it, it, it just changed her whole life about that. I mean, you know, she was kind of like you could tell she was in a hurry. And the kids were like this. Going, ah, and, uh, and she saw two guys reach for the door. And. And it changed her whole attitude. She commented, oh, boy, look, I got two gentlemen. This is a good day. And, uh, and it was. You know, it just makes a difference. Just a, a simple act of kindness sometimes. Politically incorrect. Do what? Politically incorrect. Oh, yeah, as well. <laughs> I had never been politically correct, I don't think. Praise the Lord. Well, anyhow, a joyful heart makes a cheerful face. So what's in your heart is reflected in your face, isn't it? Our attitudes and things. But when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. You know, he didn't, he didn't say your heart, he didn't say your face changes, although we know people wear it. You can't not wear the emotions of your heart. There's no way you can not wear it. You can fake it for a little bit. You can fake it for a minute, and then you're back into that, oh. But he didn't say that. He said a cheerful heart affects your face. But that's not what he said on the reverse side. On the reverse side, when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. You see, if the spirit is broken, it's, it doesn't have, there's no way to have it cheerful. The spirit is broken. A sad face. One that stays sad. Good morning. How are you doing? God bless you. Have a great day. 
Isn't it wonderful to be alive? No. See, nothing, nothing is able to change that. It's because the spirit is broken. A sad face that remains sad when it should be cheerful is because they have a broken spirit. Now, how do you fix that? You say, well, I'm going to tell you about it today. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you in four points if I can get there. If not, I'll send the paper home with you. All right. It's that major crisis at Christmas, not unusual. But what's unusual is how to resolve it. And not resolve it over a long period of time. Well, I know I've got to work my way back. And I got, now I'm talking about changing your heart. Boom, there you got it. I'm not talking about a long process of changing your heart. Boom, there you got it. I'm going to show it to you today in the life of Joseph. I'm going to show it to you in the life of Joseph. For Mary, this Christmas was a time of great joy. That's the story of, of Luke 1 and 2. For, for her, she was a happy camper. But when you come to the life of Joseph in Matthew, the first chapter, it's a sad deal. You talk about a guy whose spirit is broken. It is Joseph. You can read about it in Matthew 1, 18 through 25 on our lesson text. What is interesting, though, is in Matthew 1, 18, Matthew 1.18 introduced the reason for Joseph's major crisis. We talked about this last week. It says before they came together, that is marriage and sex, she was found to be with child. Only later does he discover it's by the Holy Spirit. In a way, only in the way that he could accept it. Now the there's two ways you discover things. One is somebody tells you, and another thing, you go like, I don't know. You have to discover it for yourself. And that's the story behind Joseph today. That's the story behind Joseph today. When Joseph found out that she was with pregnant, he jumped all over the place with how that could be and concluded with a wrong conclusion that she had committed adultery when the fact was she, was, she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, he discovered that after he discovered. The second discovery is what changed his whole life. That it was not by another person. It was done by the person of the Holy Spirit, not another human male. Okay? And so we're going to talk about that tonight because there's a... There's a big gap there. When he first discovers Mary's pregnant, his world collapsed around him. He went into a funk position of his life. And then something happened to cause him to rediscover that changed his whole attitude about Mary and about life. And he learned how to overcome crisis in his life through it. The little exercise God had allowed him to go changed his life forever on how to deal with crisis. Now, I want to share with you today what he discovered. One of the things that's really important to a guy like me is when I find that what he discovered pushed his life on a course that caused great crisis, unnecessary crisis, unnecessary misery in his life. And so for a guy like me, the word found, heurisco, the way it's structured in the Greek language is really important. So let me tell you what that is in the Greek language. The word, sh she was found to be with child by Joseph, is an aorist passive indicative. And it's, of course, third, third feminine, third singular feminine. Mary, she was found. You see, there's nothing in the English language like an aorist tense. So I'm going to tell you something about the aorist tense. The aorist passive indicative behind the word found says there's a whole story behind the story. Aorist passive indicative says there's a story that you have to know behind the story. So let me tell you how this works. The aorist tense on your paper is an important point in past time. An aorist tense is a point divorced from time of past time. It's a past time tense, found, not find, 
found. That's past tense. But it's a point in past time that has everything to do with the present story. So something happened. The, the found, she was found to be with child. That whole thing occurred sometime in the past. And we know what it was. It was three months ago. And there's a story behind it. You see, it requires a story. Now, to get the story that he's struggling with in Matthew 1, you would have to read, Matthew, you would have to read Luke 1 because the story behind Matthew 1 is Luke 1. And you know this story, but you see, the heiress tense tells us there's a story at a point in time before she was found where the whole story began. What, what is the beginning of the story? And that is the story of Mary going to visit her, her aunt Elizabeth in the mountains who was pregnant, who had been barren, and in her old age, like Sarah, had gotten pregnant, right? Uh, a miraculous pregnancy by her husband, but miraculous in that she had been barren and menopausal and had a baby. And so Mary has gone to spend time with her <clears throat> to help her and aid her and support her. Elizabeth is in her sixth month, right? She's in her sixth month, and she's apparently having some difficulty, and so Mary's gone to assist, as the women did in that day, the young women. So she's gone to assist her uh, in the final tr try of her pregnancy. She's gone to assist and do what she can help as part of the family. That's what we, we still do that stuff, and that's a good thing in the South. We do, so what has happened now in the heiress tent, she's going off there, she's helped. Before she left to go there, she got pregnant. The Holy Spirit, she got pregnant. So that when she returned, see, we studied that last week. So when she returned, she was three months pregnant. Or we might say she's showing. She's three months pregnant. That's the heiress tent. The aorist tense in the Greek language demands a discovery. When you find the aorist tense, there's a discovery behind it. There's a story behind it. You are commanded as a teacher to find out, right? That's the aorist tense. Very important. He didn't put it in the present tense. He could have put it in the present tense. There's a lot of tense. He didn't do it. He put it in the aorist tense. Okay? So it demands a story. I just gave you a brief synopsis of that story okay the passive voice is interesting because the subject receives that action the passive voice that's in English the same way but the so she received this passive voice refers to Mary becoming pregnant by the Holy Spirit before leaving to visit Elizabeth now when she gets home and tells this story the response of Joseph is going to be something like, are you kidding me? Of course, that's a pun, but are you kidding me? Right? Are you kidding me? The indicative mood, it shows that he, he's not going to buy into this. Oh, yeah, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, the bird came along. The big bird came along. And, and yeah, yeah, right. The indicative mood in the Greek is the mood of reality. It refers to the major crisis of Joseph when discovering Mary's pregnancy. And so when you look at this in the Greek language, there's a story behind the story, and there always is, isn't there? Or we might say there's two sides to every story. And that's what the heiress passive indicative tells you. There's always two sides to this story. And for Joseph... There were two sides to the story. The one side was so far out when Mary tells him, oh, I, was, I got pregnant by the Holy Spirit. He went like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some questions, I, at least in my mind, some questions that might have driven him crazy during this period. <laughs> For example, how can a virgin become pregnant without copulation? I mean, it's just not, it just doesn't make any sense. And for a person with good common sense, this would have drove him nuts, wouldn't it? 
Who has ever heard of a miraculous conception by the Holy Spirit? Is there anybody ever had anything like this that I can have? Or is any place in the Bible give me an example of that? Mm. Is there scripture to support Mary's claim of a miraculous conception? How could Mary do this to us? How am I going to face my family and my friends? What am I going to tell them when I call off the wedding? What does the Bible tell me to do in case of adultery? Had she committed adultery? But that's his conclusion because he didn't buy any of the other ones. And so a crisis has entered his life. Being an honorable man, he wanted to put her away. He wanted to divorce her secretly or quietly. Actually, privately, there's no such thing as the other to do it privately. But he chose divorce. Listen to what Proverbs 13, 12 tells you. This is a very important point for you for Christmas. Hope deferred. See, sometimes we create our own losses that aren't losses at all. Think about that. You know what, what, when you lose hope, you have just created one of the great losses in your life. You, you have created it. Hope deferred makes the heart sad. That's where Joseph is. It means his spirit's been broken. But desired fulfilled. But desired fulfilled is a tree of life. And he's going to find that tree of life. There's going to be a gift under it. First Christmas tree. The tree of life. Going to find a great gift this Christmas under that tree of tree of life. My third point. My third point? Yeah, I guess so. I sped right through that one, didn't I? It is interesting that Mary must have told Joseph basically the same thing face to face that Gabriel told him in a dream. We're, we're, we suppose the angel of the Lord. He's been all over the Christmas story. He is the messianic angel. And so we're, we're, we're making a, a good assumption that is Gabriel, if not, certainly God, right? She must have told him. I mean, come back, and she's discovered to be pregnant. She gives him his, her side of the story, which found in Luke. Her side of the story is in Luke. Luke 1. I ain't buying that one. <laughs> I ain't not buying that one. He bought adultery. You're not buying that one. She told him the same thing face to face that the angel Lord told him in a dream. The difference is that in deep sleep, his conscience is set aside. The conscience does not interfere in deep sleep. That's where you get your greatest rest. You never get total rest that refuels your body the way it was designed to be refueled. Until you're in deep sleep. That's why it's very important. Be careful when you take medications that disrupt deep sleep. So without interference, God has got to open. He's got an open channel. You know, without all the static and dis disruptions and all the different things that go on in our consciousness. And it's where you drop into that place. And God uses dreams all over the Bible. Right? Uses that. And Joseph lives in that dispensation when dreams were just a normal, a normal way that God talked to people. He don't do it now because he have the indwelling third member of the Godhead living inside your body. God, God is a resident. He's not an outsider. He's an insider. God dwells in you, 1 Corinthians 
6, 19, and 20. And therefore, your bodies become the temple of God. So it's interesting to me that what she told him face to face was exactly what he learned in his dream. But he didn't accept what she said. He didn't believe her. Joseph was hurt, now listen to me, and became subjective. Listen, when you get hurt, we all get hurt, we get our feelings hurt. We all, listen, you're not going to live in this old world and not get your feelings hurt. Come on. You have to live in a vacuum. As soon as you begin to talk to yourself, inner dialogue, about your hurt, quit. You say, Ron, you go well, wait. No, no. Stop. Stop talking to yourself. You're, t you're talking to somebody that's already hurt. It's full of pain. Do you have somebody else? Of course you do. Stop talking to yourself and start talking to the Lord. Because you have the indwelling Holy Spirit that makes intercessions in prayer for your life too deep with groanings too deep for words. You understand? You want to pour your heart out to somebody? You want to tell him just how you feel in the words you want to express? Listen, God is wide open for you. He will listen to you. He's got every ear because he's your Abba Father. He's your daddy. And your daddy cares more for you and your life than you could ever care for it. I mean, who else in your life has paid the price that he paid to allow you into his family? The death of an only begotten son. So when you do get hurt, don't stay in the hurt place because that's not going to win. That's a, that's a loss, loss. Rather, in the inner dialogue, when you begin to mel pay attention to it and dwell on it, quit that. Go rather to the ministry of the Holy Spirit and begin speaking through prayer and through your own heart. The Holy Spirit is there to teach and recall the word of God. He's there to comfort you. You know what Jesus called the Holy Spirit's present in your life? He called him the comforter. The counselor. The encourager. Don't stay in that place of pain. You don't have to. Go to the ministry of the Holy Spirit and then go to the Father. Go to Christ and through prayer. He is the great resolver of all of your problems. Even the ones you are so subject, don't become sub. Don't let hurt become subjective thinking. Subjective thinking is flesh. You've gone to the flesh. When you go to the flesh, you go to the world. When you go to the flesh, you go to the world. And listen, conformity to the world is just misery. There's no solutions to it. Don't do that. Don't do that. Joseph was hurt. He went subjective. And by, by that, he perceived to be tr the truth that Mary's pregnancy is by another man. And therefore, he's now pursuing the doctrine, what do I do if Mary's committed adultery? Well, I can divorce her. I can divorce her. Or, 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 listen, Joseph, while you're looking up divorce, you ought to go to Malachi, the second chapter, and read it before you make your decision because it says that God hates divorce. Now, if you're going to look up all the passages that let you wiggle out, maybe you ought to look at one that says, no, out. Let God do a miracle in your life. Let him intervene and do a miracle. But you see, he went subjective. He went flesh. He got hurt. He went flesh. Flesh takes your world, and now he's into worldview. He's not into biblical view. Even though he's looking up all the passages that deal with divorce, he's not paying attention to very, very well to Matthew 
uh, to Malachi, the second chapter. That's my opinion, okay, as I look at it. So what is he doing? What he's got to have, if he's, if he's going to get his life back on track, he's got to be by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. He's got to walk by faith, not walk by sight. Is he walking by sight? Oh, yeah. Even though he's in the Bible and got Bible references, if he finds one he don't like, he throws it away. Like we all do. Well, that don't fit what I want. Listen, when you're going to look it up and you're going to read it, you've got to read it all and then, and then decide how you're going to do it. When he went to sight, he went to rationalism and he went to empiricism and he thinks he's free. Truth of the matter, he's not. And so he chose to believe, what he chose to believe about her was that she was unfaithful to the Lord and unfaithful to him and so he, he moved forward on the idea of divorce. You want to be careful when you begin to say, I know what the will of God is, and you haven't looked up all the scriptures on the will of God. Would that be safe? Because there was one that would have said, put the brakes on, big boy. Put the brakes on. Put the brakes on. The problem was that none of this, listen, the problem in Joe's life, that everything that he's assumed to be true is not. None of it. Not one. The only thing that's true is Mary's pregnant. Everybody's 100% about that. Everything else is not. Everything else is not. The problem was that none of this was true in his life. Other than she's pregnant. And she's three months pregnant. Yet it is what he chose to believe. You see, his misery is self-induced. The worst misery that you can have in your life, but is the easiest to correct, is self-induced. But it's the hardest to get people to understand. I deal a lot with counseling, and it's the hardest thing in the world to get Joseph out of this idea, and he's got two or three scriptures, and no matter how many you put up against it, he goes like, nah, nah, I found the ones I want. It's hard. And yet it's the easiest one for him to personally fix. It's self-induced. Just fix it. Pull the nail out and let's, let's, let's get a shot and go on. Why are you carrying the nail around in your hand? Well, my hand hurts. Why? Well, you got a nail in it. I know. Well, why are you carrying it around? Well, it's a trophy of my pain, right? That's the way people do it, except they do it on the inside. They don't do it on the outside. I've known people that carried pain around for 20, 30 years. They blame everybody in the whole wide. The, the birds don't sing right in the morning. They blame the birds. We call this self-induced misery. All of his miseries and agony of his soul is unnecessary because it's all self-induced. Do, do you understand self-induced misery? Well, then get out of it. All right? It's quicksand. It's playing in quicksand. Here's a doctrinal principle, one that we learned when we studied the book of Job uh, and dealing with suffering that our, our people, we felt people really need to understand suffering that's undeserved. And so we went through the book of Job to try to encourage our people that when suffering comes on you, you can't figure it out. Undeserved suffering. There are three categories. There's undeserved suffering, there's divine discipline suffering, and there's self-induced misery suffering. Well, when we went through the book of Job, we found a, 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 a wonderful common doctrinal principle that applies to Joseph today. It is that false assumptions lead to false interpretations. Now listen to me. Listen, Joseph. False assumptions lead to false interpretations, which lead to false expectations that lead to false applications. And boy... That thing works all the time. I, you pick me a story out of the Bible and let's study it and you're going to find this in it. You're going to find it. The, po the point that I want to make is how do, we, how do we get change in the midst of misery? How, do we, how, how can we change from self-induced misery to find the joyful heart again 
with a cheerful face. How can we do that? Well, they say this is going to take a long process. We're going to have to go through a lot of hours of counseling, take some medication, you know, probably go on a long cruise somewhere, uh, come on back, and uh, maybe the whole community will have changed while you're gone, and a, a sweet breeze will flow through, your, through the house, and you will go like, oh, wonderful. Or you can do it God's way. Or you can do it God's way. How can, how can this change? How can this change in such a way that I can have peace in my heart, peace in my soul? Listen to Proverbs 15, 15. You know what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to encourage you to read the book of Proverbs. Don't read through it in one month. Read out, out of the book of Proverbs one idea every day and, and watch God do marvelous things out of the book of Proverbs. A proverb. Listen to what this proverb says. 1515. All the days of the afflictions are bad. I, we would all agree with that, wouldn't we? <laughs> but a cheerful heart has a continuous fe feast. Festive. Oh, people, that's what I desire for you. That's what I desire for you. This false assumption, interpretation, expectation, application, you know what that is? It's Romans 12 too. It's Romans 12 too. It's conformity to the world. You see, once you go to, once you go to, once your pain, once you take it to your flesh, your flesh takes it to the worldview. It's called conformity to the world. Listen, if you want change, you're not going to find it that way, not conformity. What you're going to find it is transformation. Transformation. God wants you to live in transformation, not conformity to the world. You've lived that way all your life. Quit it. God has something better for you. That's why he redeemed you. It's called transformation. Here's how transformation. Listen, here's how it all works, and it works overnight. I don't mean take the pill and wake up in the morning. I mean before you go to sleep, you can have it done. Before you go to sleep, you can have it done. Listen to me. The renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind. To what, Ron? Listen to me. Here's Romans 12 too. Renewing your mind to the specific will of God that you're struggling about with a problem. You don't have a problem. The word of God doesn't have a solution. Not one. I tell my guys who go through the seminary with me to look at the back of your Bible with a concordance and identify your problem and then look up all the places in the Bible that tells you how to fix it. Wouldn't that be a good place to start? Start with your own Bible. That'd be a good place. And if you don't have a study Bible with it, go buy one. It's the best investment. It beats drugs. It's a lot cheaper than drugs. I can tell you that. Listen, every crisis in a believer's life, watch this now, I got it on your paper, every crisis, every crisis in the believer's life is divinely designed to focus attention on the revealed directive will of God for your life. Did I say some? No, I, I said every. I mean every. Is that bold? <laughs> Is that bold? I'm not a rookie either. I'm not a rookie pastor. I haven't just come out of seminary. I haven't just come out of the, the calling. And I'm going to tell you, this is absolutely true. If you could ever get this under your belt, this is absolutely every crisis. Every, I don't care what, how you tag it. Every crisis in the life of a believer is divinely designed to focus attention on the revel revelation of the revelation that God is revealing to you, his directive will. What is the specific category that God is trying to touch your life? With Joseph here, it's specific. This is not a broad, how will I figure it out? We're not going to get a divorce. We're going to get married, Joseph. And so I'm here to renew your heart. I'm, I, I'm here to change your mind and your position because it's a false assumption. 
It's not right. It's not true. And if you follow this course, you're going to get in trouble with me. Because I set this whole thing up. You see, who, who orchestrated this whole deal? Who, who did all this? How come he didn't talk to both of them together? <laughs> because he's got different lessons to teach each of them separately to put them together. It's about walking by faith and not by sight. Because every crisis in a believer's life is de designed by God to focus specific on how you approach the directive will of God in your life. How you approach it. Are you going to walk it out by faith? Or are you going to play with this idea of sight? Well, I will do it after I get yeah, 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 yeah. That's sight. It, sight don't take you to faith. It don't, it don't work. We walk by faith. Not. Not. I say. So, Joseph went to bed feeling miserable. Here's how quick it goes. He went to bed. Would you agree he went to bed feeling miserable? Yeah. <laughs> huh? If he was here, he'd still be crying. Joseph went to bed feeling miserable, and he woke up feeling great. He went from mis mis miserable to mistletoe. How did that happen? Huh? And it, and it wasn't a hallmark. I've learned more about mistletoe watching the hallmark with my wife than about any other thing I knew about Christmas. I mean, I did, some guy would go like, is that mistletoe? And they go, no, that's not mistletoe. It's that. And I go like, are you kidding me? I thought that. <laughs> Who knew? Any excuse to kiss. So I guess that's it. What happened? He went to bed miserable and woke up happy. Looking for mistletoe. He wanted to kick her out of, every, out of his life, get rid of her. And he went, went to bed miserable and got up with mistletoe. Everywhere he went, he had a little mistletoe above him. What happened to change his major crisis to a festive, positive outlook for life? And it happened overnight. Right? It's a long, what's a long draw? Now, this is a very complicated deal. If he went to a psychologist, he'd have kept him long enough to pay for his house. Divine intervention at Bible study. You know how he learned it? Learned it at Bible study. <laughs> he was open to Bible study. He went to sleep, fell into deep sleep. God said, I want a whole Bible study. And Joseph couldn't say, no, I've already made my mind up. God had him in deep sleep. So he's like, here it is. Let me tell you about it. You wake up. I hope you'll go my way. If not, I'm going to take the switch to you. <laughs> because Joseph and Mary are positive towards divine truth. Where am I? Have I got enough time to quit? Yeah, about seven, minutes. seven minutes. All right. I'm, I want to I wanna get you out of here because you got to go to work. Because Joseph Mary are positive towards divine truth and towards the directive will of God, God is able, listen, God is able and willing to give them specific truth from the word of God, which we call categorical Bible doctrine, specific information on the directive will of God for a problem regarding Mary's pregnancy. You know, you know what in bigger terms we call this? Listen, every church talks this way. You know what that, the bigger picture is Romans 8, 28. God works all things together for good. You know what we're talking about here? We're talking about God worked all the little things that he's got to work. He's got to put this here and he's got to put that there and he's got to put that there and he's got to put that there. You see, that's where all of that is the, the specifics of dealing with it. See, see, when we quote Romans 8, 28, what I'm showing you today is the inner workings of Romans 8, 28 working. I'm showing you how this thing is working in the heart and life of people. All things work together. Yeah, but look how it's working together. He's got Mary over here, and he's got Joseph over here, and he's, he's got the angels over here, and he's got, the, he's got sheep out there with, with shepherds. And, you know, I mean, yeah, whoa. Whoa. And all he's got for us is one little net picking thing to do.
but it's important to your life and it's important to his plan. It's called the directive will of God. That specific thing that he's trying to get you, that you have a specific problem. Tell me what your problem is, honey. <laughs> That'll get you specific. Now, finding the doctrinal solution. What's the directive will of God about that problem? And then getting people to change their mind to do that. The renewing of your mind to the will of God. Do you know how Romans 12, 2 closes? So that the will of God, changing your attitude to become compatible with the will of God revealed by the word of God, so that you come to a place in your life where it is good, acceptable, and perfect. Isn't that wonderful? See, Joseph has got He's going to give him that information in the morning. He's going to get up, and if he does it, he's going to find out that it was good, it was acceptable, and it was perfect. That's what God desires for your life, people. You can have a great Christmas. And out of this Christmas, working through whatever problems you might have, the great lessons that he will teach you will be lessons that you will have for the rest of your life and begin to share it with other people who don't know this. They think they have to go through this, uh, I don't know, this draining out my, <laughs> my life or whatever. Go to bed miserable, get up uh, with mistletoe. That's what I want for your life. That's exactly what I want. Divine wisdom. John 8.32, you will know the truth. And when you know it to application, that truth will set you free. When you know. Know the truth means to exercise it. Know it and do it. Know it and do it. it will free you. If, did it free Joseph? You know what he did? He got up married. He got up married Mary. Mary, Merry Christmas. That he took that mistletoe right over to the house, didn't he? Huh? He got up that morning, took mistletoe over. What a happy! What a happy! This turned out to be what a happy Christmas. It is never the intentions of God that any believer fail in the execution of His directive will. Mary didn't. Luke one thirty eight. May it be done unto me according to the will of, of God or according to his word. Joseph did, the Bible says, Joseph did as the Lord commanded him. I salute you, Joseph. He went to bed miserable and got up with mistletoe. God bless you, buddy. God bless you. Spiritual enlightenment, Ephesians 1.18. I pray, this is my prayer for you. I pray that your hearts may be enlightened. And that's why this lesson is the intention. So that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance? That's, listen, I want you to have that now. Not when you die. I want you to have that now. This is John 10.10. 10. This is the abundant life in Christ. Have it now. Have it this Christmas. And this greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, undeserved suffering, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, anything you could put under the Christmas tree, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found, watch this now, may be found. That's our same word with Mary in the beginning, found. The same word, found. Now for Joseph, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor. Glory, praise, and honor. And certainly, that's how this story is going to close. 